welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight in this very hot night. Um, my name is Alessandra Moctezuma, and I'm the gallery director here at San Diego Mesa College. Um, I curate the exhibitions in our gallery, uh, and I'm also a professor of museum studies. I just want to mention that um, all of our exhibits um, and the gallery serve as a, um, a lab for our museum studies students. So our students work with us. They learn about uh, exhibition design. They learn about installation. They help us um, as gallery attendants. And so it's a really wonderful experience for them. They are doing a mini internship. And it's exciting for them also to get to work with uh, many uh, fantastic artists. Um, I met Kathy Breslow s several years ago. So we've been planning this show for at least two or three years. Yes. I first saw her work at the Oceanside Museum of Art. Uh, and um, I was really struck by her exhibition because of the uh, unique use of materials. And if you've been to the exhibition in the gallery, you see that she uses industrial materials um, but gives them these organic uh, shapes and, and, and a feeling of um, almost like underwater landscapes or uh, constellations. Um, I also um, really ad admired her work uh, because I see her uh, having a, almost a scientist vision. And so some of the pieces reminded me of somebody looking through a microscope and lo looking at cells um, or um, somebody who's interested in optics and studies the uh, waves of color. Um, I also wanted to bring her work to the gallery uh, because she adapts the material so that soft materials like fabric become three-dimensional uh, or um, liquid materials become solid like the um, piece that's on the floor done with uh, acrylic and plaster. So the transformation of the materials was really unique and, and uh, would, would be great uh, for our students to learn. Um, Kathy Breslow is a prolific artist. She's exhibited her work um, all over the United States. Um, and um, she is also a writer, um, uh, interviewed many uh, arts professionals uh, here in San Diego and also writes reviews for art scene and vanguard culture. So um, that's uh, another way in that she's amazing because she, besides being an artist, she also looks at art from that other side, from the observer, and uh, relays that information to, to us. Um, I am not going to talk anymore, but I want you guys to please um, give a warm welcome to Kathy Breslow, and she's going to tell us more about her work. Thank you. So, Alessandra, thank you very much for that great introduction. Um, first of all, what I wanted to do was to thank several people because without them, this exhibition could not be. And um, so I will proceed to do that. Um, I want to thank Jenny Armour for helping with the installation, the, the, the lighting, creating the invitation, the banner, the posters, and any number of <coughs> helping things that she helped along with the exhibition. I want to thank uh, Mara Nosland and Kevin Brown for helping with installation, Michael Gast for doing audiovisual visual uh, video, um, and Neil, who is here, Batia who's doing the video, uh, doing the video lecture tonight. And most importantly, I really want to thank um, Pat Vine and Alessandra Moctezuma. Pat is an amazing uh, coordinator and runs the whole installation of shows and just does an amazing amount of things that has been so important to the installation of my show as well as a number of other things. So. And also, uh, Alessandra uh, Moctezuma, she and I, I think, are a mutual admiration society here because I very much admire her and the work that she's done. And I've reviewed many of the shows that have been here. And I highly uh, admire the shows that she's presented in San Diego. So with that, um, I also wanted to thank Francisco M.A., who I don't know if he's still here. Um, he was, oh, there he is, okay, who um, he and I um, collaborated on a sound piece for one of the installations in the 
in the show, which I'm also going to show here, and he's an amazing sound artist who um, I just recently met, and together we put together what I think is just an awesome installation. So I thank him for his work and his help. Um, and, and, and lastly, but not less importantly, I wanted to thank um, my, hus my husband, Paul, who um, is a great support and has helped me a lot. So anyway, with that said, um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about um, sort of my background. I'm going to be, it's the, the slideshow that I'm about to present is not linear. I, I don't start in the beginning and then go to the end. I'm going to jump around a little bit because the development of my work has kind of gone back and forth in time. Um, I have, I started out as a painter many years ago. Um, I've been showing my work professionally since the 1990s and I have evolved from using uh, water media, mixed media, into using 3D materials and transparent um, materials. So with that said, the first piece here that I want to talk about is <clears throat> In 2015, in, Jan in April actually, um, I developed this piece, which is also in this show, uh, called Dreamscape. And it's an installation that um, was inspired by the space that it was in. It's uh, extreme, I don't know if any of you have been to the Francis Parker School, the James Allen Rose Gallery, but it's an amazing uh, gallery space that's been around for four or five years, and it's got extremely high ceilings and lots and lots of natural light. It's an artist's dream to create uh, an exhibition in that space. And um, so the motivation and inspiration had a lot to do with nature and sky and clouds and birds and also the landscape and typography. Um, and that's where the, the floor piece came about, which is also connected to sort of my painting aesthetic, which um, I still carry into all my 3D work as well as my painting. Um, just very interested in still, you know, connecting with uh, painting as, as, a, as, a, as a medium in and of itself. So I really honor it still as an important, an important part of my work. So in January, I had an exhibition at the University of Tulsa in Oklahoma. And I actually went there and did a lecture and worked with the students and had a wonderful experience. And after I left, I found out that the dance department had seen my show and really enjoyed it very much and wanted to, um, and were inspired by it and created their own um, dance piece called Physical Visions. The show was called Material Visions and they uh, did their own piece called Physical Visions and it was just such a, an amazing thing for me because I've never had any group or any dance people that have gotten involved but I kind of see the connection because a lot of my work has to do with movement um, and light and I think that it, it, um, it definitely was a natural progression for the students. And so they developed a whole video and they, they did the thing in like a couple weeks before the show came down. And um, so it's a wonderful uh, thing. And if you wanted to see the actual video, there's like an eight minute video, it's on YouTube under my name, Kathy Breslau. So if you're interested, they put music to it and it's really quite something. So this you may recognize. This is the piece that's here, Sensations, which is the piece that I collaborated with um, Francisco M.A. And um, this piece was inspired by a trip that uh, we took last summer to Alaska. And Alaska is a very um, dense place as far as the landscape and so forth. But there's very few people. And I, so, the, so nature really took a very big priority in my mind, you know, in terms of looking at um, the landscape and the, the wildlife and the vegetation, just everything about it, I was just really wrapped up in and I was, I was very inspired and for a long time af after I went, I was wanting to create something. I, I just had this big need to create um, an installation piece that had to do with that. Um, and so, um, these are a couple pictures that are kind of background ideas to what I was thinking. 
Um, so the American Eagle just happened to be sitting on uh, the top of this iceberg. So we went out on a boat in the Prince William Sound and they took us this one day just, it was just a very quiet, very sublime kind of environment. It's cloudy, it's quiet, there aren't a lot of people, there aren't a lot of boats. And we just went, drove through this just wonderland of ice sculptures, if you can imagine that. And it was so amazingly inspiring. And I took tons of photos, of course, and uh, of all kinds of um, shapes. And to me, they're very sculptural. And to me, they're sculptures in and of themselves. But they were created by the environment. And they were created by the fact that there is a certain amount of climate change going on. And, the icebergs are breaking off from the actual glacier because it's Columbia Glacier is um, a like a 14 mile solid ice piece and every now and then pieces break off so they become they're these icebergs they're just everywhere and they're just so naturally amazing and gorgeous so and that's what inspired the installation and um, I think this the video um, I, I retexturized a lot of the photos and so the video um, has to do with a lot of the textures and patterns and things that I felt about the place and then Francisco M.A.'s piece um, has the sense of the cracking of the ice and the sort of the ominous sort of sublime nature of the environment. So another piece the here and that's also here Spirit Moves is has to do with nature it's very organic it's pretty straightforward in that sense. Um, a lot of it has to do with the, um, the shadows created on the walls and the movement. Um, very interested in the movement of nature and how things move back and forth um, and how nature kind of carries us through space and time. Um, and these pieces are made from paper, wire, and paint. So there's very simple, simple materials, yet um, I like to start out with simple materials and see where it takes me. So this is a show that I had in the, uh, let's see, last fall, just about a year ago, <laughs> basically. And this was called Contemplation at the uh, Gott Health Gallery at the Jewish Center in La Jolla. And the pieces along the back wall kind of fit in with the Spirit Moves piece because they, it's hard to see in the picture, but they're, they're, falling, they're leaning off the wall. They're mixed media pieces and they were, um, the series is called Swept Away, and they have to do with just the nature of like things that are caught up in wind and moving, and they, they just kind of flow through space. And that's kind of the feeling I wanted to evolve from that. And then the, the yellow piece is more of a contemplative piece that has to do with introspection. And, and actually, since it was the Center for Jewish Culture, it has to do with the High Holidays of Rosh Hashanah, which is a time of introspection. and um, reflection, and so that's that piece has to do with that. This piece was uh, these pieces along that back wall um, are part of a large series, and there's a couple of these pieces in the show here um, that have they're called Atmosphere the series, and once again it's the feeling um, of a of the atmosphere that in which we live, and um, that was my basic idea in developing them, and I worked with several layers of spray paint, spray painted pieces of the mesh and layered them uh, to create, the, the, the idea was is to create the feel, a feeling, a particular, particular feeling, which is very much related to color field painting. So it's influenced by nature, but it's also influenced by color field painting, um, which has been around for a long time. So it's more of how, how someone might react to the experience of being with, with it. This is uh, another installation called Above, Below, and Beyond. Um, it was designed as a room installation for the Walker's Point Center for the Arts in Milwaukee. And it <clears throat> involved um, a hanging, a suspended piece, but also there's reflective um, stickers on the floor that create kind of an abstract painting that you can actually walk on. And I don't know if any of you saw it, but I, I had this piece at uh, Sparks Gallery in, in July to August. I don't know if anyone happened to see it, but um, this piece was uh, displayed there for a month, and, um, but it didn't include the wall pieces. So this was really more designed for a room, a room installation. But 
Um, it's, it's kind of like very much nature oriented, um, like a canopy, kind of a canopy of um, organic feeling, but it also relates to painting. It's very much connected to painting. So, uh, going back in time now, becoming an artist, early influences. So, when I grew up, I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, and my family had a fabric business. And that's sort of what I attribute my beginnings in terms of art and how I think about art, and was being around fabrics of all kinds, the textures, the patterns, the colors, the feeling of, you know, actually feeling the material, and working with the material and of course you know being a member of the family of a small business you know we were all expected to be there and uh, be part of that so that was sort of an in, a, a beginning one of the early influences of my work as an artist was the work of, of Wassily <laughs> Kandinsky um, I've always been, admired his work because of the color and the movement and the rhythm it's very musical and I enjoy that. So that his work has always been um, extremely interesting to me, and he also had a big series of watercolor paintings that um, were very inspiring to me. So this is a piece I did uh, in the early 90s, sort of at the beginning of my development as an artist in terms of using watercolor. So um, I was very interested in transparencies. And you can sort of see the connection in the work that I do now, that the idea of layering and transparencies. And I was just developing and learning and you know, experimenting with the medium. And as time went on, I became also interested in calligraphy, not calligraphy, but calligraphic line work that is very present in Chinese and Asian um, painting and drawing, uh, and became interested in that. So I, for a while, had, had developed an interest in that and did some work along those lines. And this piece um, very much has to do with light, um, illumination it's called, and this is a mixed media on paper. And this is very much connected to the same ideas of light and color, um, and a little bit with space. So research and development of my work. So uh, many years ago, actually the year 2000, I was looking to um, learn more, sort of develop my art more, and wanting to move forward with my work, and was not ready yet to go to graduate school, and so um, it was recommended to me to go see Roland Rees, who is a well-known uh, painter and wonderful, wonderful artist in Los Angeles, and he was the founder of the Claremont Graduate School uh, program for visual arts, and so he kind of took me under his wing and I would go to his studio in LA like once a month. I would drag my work and he would explain it and uh, we would talk about contemporary art. That's basically what we did. We talked a lot about contemporary art for like four years. I did that once a month. Hauled my art up there and he'd look at it. And, but a lot of the time was just discussing art, just dis discussing contemporary art. and. Um, it, it was a very integral part of the development of my work. So my work kind of went through changes. Um, I was using, starting to use plastic paper in paint and uh, experimenting with space and movement, um, taking out a lot of the um, details. Um, I think my work kind of went through a big uh, change, a big change in terms of how I thought about it, in terms of I was thinking about space. You can see in a lot of these there's very few, Im very, very little imagery in, in the pieces. This is on canvas. Um, so I was thinking a lot about space. And I think one of the things to know about artists is that you know you go through different uh, phases in the development of your work over time. And, and these are sort of evidences of thoughts, basically, through time. Um, and then I started doing some hard edge painting. Um, and some more precise kinds of work, which wasn't really um, something I wanted to continue with after a while, but I investigated it. And you can still see a lot of the sort of loose um, splotches of paint um, still having that in my work, even now. Um, and I developed a whole series of pieces called Passages, um, which for a while I was into systems and computer systems and wanting to learn more about um, how systems work. So systems theory was part of my thinking at the time. 
And um, so I did a fair number of these. And then um, I decided to go back to school. I was ready to actually go back and, and get an MFA. And so I did that in 2003, finished in 2006. It was really a turning point in the development of my work. I mean, I'm still using the same kinds of ideas in some ways, but um, during that time, I was influenced by several types of artists, one of which um, sculptors and installation artists, and Eva Hess is an artist that's very well known. She died at a very young age, she was 34 when she passed away, but she experimented with lots of interesting and different materials, and that's what she was really known for. Um, and uh, so she and a lot of other artists that are similar to her, I was very influenced by. So when I was at Claremont, I had an idea that I wanted to create paintings without a surface. So I didn't want canvas, I didn't want paper, I just wanted, I had no idea how I was going to do it, but I wanted to do it. And so I created these by pouring paint um, and letting them dry and creating grid patterns. So that was kind of the beginning of the process of trying to figure out how was I going to create paintings without a surface. This is quite quite a thing. I, I looked into all kinds of chemical compounds that you could add to the paint that would perhaps create, you know, uh, a, sort of a more solid thing because, you know, acrylic paint is very stretchy. It's made from plastic, so it's very stretchy and it's not conducive to what I really wanted to do, but I didn't quite know how else to do it. So this is another piece that was created at that time that, um, and I was using some, some plexi supports that you can't really see. They're very thin rods of plexi. So then I thought, okay, so now I need to find some materials to use. If I'm not going to be able to just let suspend paint, I needed some materials to kind of create the surface that wouldn't be obtrusive in the work itself. It would be kind of like a background thing. So. Often, uh, as part of our promotional products uh, company our family has, um, we go to Southeast Asia, and at a trade show, I found this particular material, which is the material you see in the, in the gallery. It's a transparent industrial mesh, and it's made from plastic. And uh, on this trip that we went, we actually visited, this, uh, this is Shanghai, um, when we were coming into Shanghai, China, and the plastics company um, that we visited was outside of Shanghai where I purchased the material. Okay, so um, these are the owners of the company and they took us through and showed us the machinery and showed us how they're, they're made, it's made from extrusion molding machines and you may not think that, it may not be so interesting, but to me it was very interesting at the time to see the source of all of it and how it was created, how it was made. I'm just very curious by nature. I'm kind of relentlessly curious. So um, it was a great experience to go see the, um, the factory. And um, this in the foreground is how I receive the mesh that I order. Um, but mostly these days I'm using uh, white um, mesh. So I'm more painting my own materials. Um, I do paint these as well, but I'm more, I'm also using some different kinds of things and then spray painting them myself. So when I started experimenting with the mesh, um, I, I wanted to create large scale work. Um, for some reason, I've always been interested in large, in large pieces. This is 99 by 96, so it's quite large. And the idea was to use the transparencies as I was involved with watercolor and acrylic and all the different um, transparent mediums. So um, I did a lot of layering and this was one of those pieces. And you'll notice that there's a lot of shadows around the piece and that's on purpose because I wanted to create more of a sculptural feel. And I hang most of these pieces, you might have noticed there's a few in the gallery, I hang them at least three to five inches away from the wall because I like the idea of the sculptural effect of seeing behind the piece being able to look behind the piece, see through the piece, look behind the piece, and you know, see the shadows that are created as a result. And this is a, uh, an example of a piece where um, I was also adding materials to the mesh um, as a way of kind of investigating texture and pattern and the yarn and the paint and the 
the buttons, I used all different kinds of materials, were simply a, a device that mimicked paint and line. So it was pretty fun creating a lot of these different um, pieces. And this is another example of some of the different ways that I've used the material. So I really just kind of went through an investigative process for a period of three, four years where I was doing a lot of wall pieces and just trying to investigate different ways of creating the piece. So this is a floor piece um, called Carousel and it's similar to the one that you see in the, in the gallery now called Labyrinth that's like blues and greens, the one that's in the gallery and this was created around the same time. And um, <clears throat> I used a lot of, um, once again, beads, buttons, all kinds of materials to create a pattern. And I was using the structure of the spiral, which, which also relates to nature. Once again, um, a certain kind of uh, structure and form to the actual piece itself. So concepts and ideas that inform my work. So one of the important things, because I'm very interested in space and light. Um, I ha I've been very influenced by the environment in which we live, and I know we all are, but for me, it's, it's been a very important part of what I do and how I do it. So I'm a runner and I spend a lot of time outdoors, um, and so moving through space is one of the ways in which I sort of uh, connect with the world um, and that has very much influenced my my thoughts and feelings about light and color um, so I am often inspired by um, impressionist work um, in the past growing up and going to museums and one particular piece that I was very inspired by was Claude Monet's Water Lilies. I don't know if any of you have seen this, but it's um, this. This were the la these were the last panels that he did before he passed away, and he did this in the very last years of his life. And they were very different than his earlier work, and they were very much more abstract and and dense and deep and um, very sort of spiritual to me. So. Um, and very meditative. So this was a very important piece to me, and I was looking to create a piece for a show that I had, um, which is also here, um, that I created for Soka University. I had a show there some years back, uh, yeah, 2011 or 12, 12 maybe. And, um, and I was very much inspired by, um, by that kind of work, the Impressionist work and a meditative experience. And Soka University, I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but it, it's in Orange County in Aliso Viejo, and it's based on a, um, Soka University is a Japanese-based uh, university. It's a four-year liberal arts college, got lots of students, um, but you know, you definitely know you're not in America when you're on the campus there. It's very Asian, very Japanese, very meditative, very, very lovely environment, very different than almost any other kind of college or university I've seen. So. I was very inspired and created this piece based on that. So I'm often inspired by fragile, ephemeral, and fleeting nature of life. And so bubbles to me, uh, another simple idea, but bubbles to me become metaphors for thoughts and ideas because bubbles are fleeting, they're fragile, they don't last long, they're beautiful, they're, they're evocative, they're, they're, they're alive, you know, to me. So I was in Spain once and this guy just had two sticks and a big bucket of soapy water and he created these most amazing like bubbles that were just gigantic and all kinds of odd shapes and and all the kids and people around were totally taken by them and that's what this piece here which you see in the gallery was created around that idea so it was a pretty awesome fun fun piece that was based on that particular thing. So ever since I've been a kid, I've been very interested in cosmology and outer space and also just space in general, just as I was saying. And so it's always been part of my imagination. These, these photos are from the Hubble telescope and they're of course colorized because outer space is not got all those colors, but, um, but they are, are actual pictures that are from space. And I'm very, very fascinated by that and often read about it and think about it and it's all part and parcel to the kind of work that I develop and 
what I'm interested in. And here's another one that's just um, amazing. And I, I see space as interrelated. I mean, I don't see outer space as separate from our space. I see it as all one inter interconnected um, place. Um, and, and often think about what's in space itself that you don't see, like what's invisible to us is very important to me. Um, that conjures up ideas about things I can create because there's molecules and atoms and there's all kinds of things all around us as we speak, you know, and uh, it's just interesting to me to um, think about that in terms of creating my work. So, um, so at the Oceanside Museum, 2000, end of 2011, beginning of 2012, I was asked to do a, pro a project room space. Um, and the piece I developed was called A, Mat a Matter of Space. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about how, you de how I develop my work, the process by which I develop my work. So I started out with so just a few basic ideas that I wanted to do something that had to do with being reflecting, um, a reflective material, a plastic material. Um, I do a lot of research. Um, I do a lot of reading. Um, I just did a ton of thinking and reading and all, all sorts of things. And one of the ways that I do that is that I start writing and I, lots of times I'll just take big sheets of paper and start writing words down that are really important to me or um, things that come to mind. I'll do research um, for this particular project. I was doing a lot of research on the, the I think it was the Higgs boson. Boson. Yeah, boson. Yeah, the Higgs boson. Yes, in uh, France, I think it was, underground. and. Um, I was very interested in that and I was just reading about a lot of different um, kinds of things related to space and I, I just put things up around me and, and those things kind of germinate over time and that's how I kind of develop my ideas um, by, I, I don't expect to just sit down and go, okay, today I'm going to paint a this or a that, you know, I, it takes a long time for me to come up with my plan of action and so these are some pictures from that particular show. It was kind of difficult to take pictures of the actual whole space because it was small. Um, and uh, I found it difficult to do that. But, um, but I'm using a lot of different kinds of reflective materials and transparent mesh materials that you, as you can see and suspended materials just like the ones that I'm using in the, thing, in the gallery here. And this particular piece was in the show too uh, called Ray Points. Of infinity, and this is a uh, an abstract piece that was done on the reflective material, uh, which connects to uh, outer space as well. And this piece is in the gallery right now, um, which also has to do with outer space. And I'm using some uh, some plastic material as the back as the actual surface because it's a it's a commercial plastic, but it has like a holographic uh, texture to it. So it seemed to lend itself well to the ideas that I had in mind. And this is another piece that's also in the show called Space Odyssey, which is based on the same ideas and um, lots of thoughts about, you know, just things clashing in space and objects clashing and um, kind of an imaginary, imaginary or a fantasy of what I might s suspect might be in space, whether I'm there or not. So, um, and this is a, a small, smaller piece that um, was one of the first um, suspended pieces that I did called Taking Flight Again, um, which had some pieces that hang from it. So it was kind of early in the development of these kinds of larger installations. I wanted to show a picture of something that was, you know, smaller and um, that I had sort of in the beginning of the development of a lot of my ideas about installation. So I also wanted to say that um, as an artist, I feel like I'm always wanting to connect to contemporary art and also the history of the type of work I do. <clears throat> and because my work really borders on painting and sculpture and installation and so many different things, um, I really search for sort of the, the basis for my work, for the, you know, to valid, a validation in a way of my work. Um, people who do similar things to what I do and or closely related things. And a lot, of it, a lot of it has to do with textiles and fiber, which goes back to my childhood and, you know, starting out around fabrics and so forth. So um, 
I've done a fair amount of research over the years about textile and fiber work in contemporary art. Um, and there was a really interesting show that happened um, in, that ended in January of this year that was at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston, which was the history of fiber sculpture from 1960, I think, to the present. And it was really fascinating, fascinating piece, and it made me look back and investigate some of sort of the, the relatives to my work. So Annie Albers, um, who was also married to Joseph Albers, they're both very well-known known painters of the 20th century. Annie Albers is, is known as the foremost textile ar artist of the 20th century, but she was part of the Bauhaus, uh, which was started by Walter Gropius in Ger Germany in the 1920s. And this was a sort of a movement where um, they brought together the fine and applied arts that were brought together. And so Annie Albers was a painter, and then she decided to do weavings. And these were some of the examples of um, some of the pieces that she did. This is a, another piece. Um, I guess this was made in 1979, which could easily be valid today. It's a wonderful piece um, that was also made up of uh, textiles that was in the show that was in Boston. Lenore Tawney uh, was around for quite a long time. She lived 100 years, and she, she is also known as one of the early uh, textile um, artists of the 20th century. Very, as, and she's considered as a very important artist as well in terms of weaving and creating forms out of weavings and so forth. Uh, Sheila Hicks also started out as a painter. She's still alive. She's in her 80s. She was at the Whitney Museum in New York in 2013. This is a piece that she did. Um, she studied with uh, artists in Peru, weavers in Peru, and uh, which really had a big impact on her work, and she ended up uh, creating some really amazing work. So. And this is uh, this last piece is by Piotr Uglonski, who I hadn't been previously known his work, but this is a piece that, this is a giant piece. This is like a huge giant wall piece um, that he created in 2010, which was also part of this um, exhibition in Boston. So, so these are kind of some, sort of the basis that form some of the basis of the history of my work. So, um, a lot of times I, I'm very uh, addicted to reading uh, quotes, <laughs> and I have them all around my studio. I mean, one of the things I, you know, do to just keep it going a lot of times is to, you know, put familiar things, things that are important to me around me. So I wanted to leave you with this because I thought this was a quote by famed photographer Ansel Adams um, in a letter to his best friend, Cedric Wright, 1937. Um, art is both love and friendship and understanding, the desire to give. It is not charity, which is the giving of things. It is more than kindness, which is the giving of the self. It is both the taking and giving of beauty, the turning out to the light, the inner folds of the awareness of the spirit. It is the recreation of another plane of the realities of the world, the tragic and wonderful realities of earth and man, and all the inter interrelations of these. So just wanted to leave you guys with that. And with that, um, I am finished my slide talk. And if you'd like to ask questions, I'd be more than happy to um, answer them. So. The question has to do with how do I move my installation pieces when they go to another show? Yeah. Well, that's a challenge. Um, the, the earlier piece I showed you, the Taking Flight Again piece, that is smaller, so it's a little bit easier, and the, all the hanging pieces are attached to the, to the main suspended piece. So it's, I tape everything down and I fold it, and it's pinned to a larger fabric. And then whenever I send my work, I have like a set of very clear instructions. And then before they install it, I call them and we have a long conversation about it. But you know, I think you bring up a good question because when I'm in a situation like this, which is so wonderful that I could be here and help install and 
and create it myself. I get to do it my way, you know? But when I'm other places, I kind of like the idea that the curators or the installers are kind, or they're kind of part of the process of creating it. So I'm, I'm able to just let it go and let them, I, I give them instructions and I talk to them and whatever, but if it comes out differently, it's not gonna, it's, it, it's a good thing. You know, it's, it's more like I feel like I'm collaborating with someone. So anybody else have any questions? Oh, yeah. Well, I guess you're asking how did I maintain the same style from the earlier work to the more current work? And really, I have to be honest and say, I wasn't really consciously uh, forcing myself to stay within any certain bounds. Um, I think it's just the natural progression or an organic process of a natural progression of of um, sort of developing a voice. I think artists develop a voice, you know, of their own. And that takes time, like a lot of years to do that. And I think when you look at any artist that's been working for a long time, I think you can see very much connections from the beginning of their work to the, you know, to their current work. So. So to answer your question, I don't think that I re really consciously wanted to do that. I think it's just a voice. It's just like everyone has a personality, everyone has a, a certain way of viewing the world, and I think as artists, we, there, there's an evidence to that, because when you create art, you're creating evidence of, of that personality, you know? So I hope that answers your question. So you're asking um, if the meditative quality in all the work has an origin of a particular kind. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm very interested in meditation. I listen to a lot of meditations. I, uh, I'm very interested in the spiritual um, because I think there's a lot of power in it, however you want to define it. Um, so we each define it in a different way, and I, it's always something that's on my mind when I create work. I mean, off, I have in the past done meditations before I've actually gone in my studio to kind of like put me in a place of being aware and present in the present moment. That's very important to me, being in the moment. It's always something that's on my mind wanting to, and also just the idea of play because it's so easy for, for me to like go to the side of criticizing my work or criticizing my ideas or whatever. So if I am meditating and I'm thinking about the present, I, I'm not really thinking about what's wrong with it. I'm more thinking about what am I doing in the moment. Kind of like kids, you know, when they play, they, they don't really think about it. They just do it. And that's sort of the goal is to just be in the moment and just do it. So. Yeah. I had another question about your collaboration with Francisco, uh -huh. since Francisco is also here. Right. And that's interesting. I think this is, you know, we've had a lot of artists shown, mm -hmm. showing their work here, but I think it's one of the few times where we had a visual artist work with a sound artist and, and, and doing the video. So yeah. I was going to ask both of you guys if you wanted to yeah. tell us a little bit about how that process went, you know, how you shared yeah. your ideas, how did the would you like to answer that, Francisco? Uh, sure. Great. Sure. Um, well, hello, everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, first, okay. Yeah. Let's <laughs> go. There you go. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you to Kathy for the invitation. It was uh, very nice to work together, although. We really uh, work every everyone in its own studio. At some point, we we met, and then both of our languages came together. So uh, the visual language is um, very similar to the sound language in some ways. We humans tend to visualize everything, even sounds. We try to put a shape into those sounds and we when we can't we uh, uh, start looking in our memory 
to, to try to put a, an, a, an image into the sounds that we're listening to. But when we have an image and also the possibility of working with sound, you kind of, uh, as a sound artist, you are free to uh, only use the sound, the qualities of sound, to create a sensation, as the piece is called, and to create an, an, an ambience or a space, because the visual part is already completed. So in this case, uh, it's very clear that the, the theme of the piece had to do with the glacials, with the uh, climate change, and uh, with the ice. And with this uh, lonely environment, uh, of ocean and ice. So I just uh, was working also in, in, in another piece with a, a different artist. I like to really do a lot of collaborations, as many as I can. And uh, I was working on a piece about the water and the water issues in the world. And one theme that I didn't work in that, in that time was the uh, climate change. So I uh, find found myself like immediately connected to that part of Cathy's piece. Uh, so I just used some sounds that I had recorded of water, I used some sounds that I had recorded of ice, and then I uh, found some other sounds of, uh, from a video of uh, glaciers uh, uh, melting. because. It's very interesting how that environment is very silent, mm -hmm. as you describe it when you mm -hmm. are there. But when those things are melting, the sound is terrific. I mean, terrific. It's, it's huge and it's mm -hmm. amazing and it's mm -hmm. scary. So I try to adapt that to the, to the installation. A sound installation is better, you enjoy it better uh, when you are there by yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you have the chance to come back and appreciate this installation in a more intimate way, it would be really awesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to, to close, um, it's really interesting to me to share my views and at the same time learn the way the other artist is uh, translating the world we live in. So I'm really thankful. To, to Kathy, and uh, I really enjoyed working on this piece. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I think what you said about visiting the pe visiting the inst installation when no one is there, I think, is a really good point because I think what you explained to me before. Um, when we were installing it, you said that the sound is completely different when no one is in the space. When a lot of people are in the space, the bodies of people absorb, that's what you were telling me, is that the people absorb the sound, right? So you're not really experiencing the sound in the same way. So I, I think that's a really good, good point. It has a whole different feel when you're there by yourself. I think you can connect with the nuances of the sounds, you know, the uh, better. I think that's true, yeah. And I, and I thought it was great working with Francisco. And I, I love the idea of collaboration and working with sound is the first time I've ever worked with anyone with sound and it's just really exciting and fun and I hope to do more work that involves that in the future with installation, so. I think initially when I met Francisco, I had the idea of the installation. I had started working on the installation itself. I think you had seen some images of some, some of the ideas and I sent pictures of my experience there. Of course, seeing pictures and being there and the whole thing is very different, a very different experience. So for Francisco, I'm sure it was a little bit different experience. Um, but we... Um, I think that you came, I think Francisco, you came up with some sound things and then I went to visit his studio. We live far apart as far as distance, so I visited his studio in National City and um, he set up the, um, the sound 
for me to hear and we did a couple of meetings like that and then back and forth a little bit in terms of ideas for what kinds of sound might fit but um, I had no idea and I didn't really care what you know I cared but I, I was confident let's put it that way that he was gonna come up with something really good that would collaborate well with my piece so yeah yeah That's it. No more questions? So I think we're done. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you for coming.